Indiana University spent about $2 million rehabbing the Jordan River this past year. Jordan is famous for many reasons, but mostly for its significance in the Christian religion, as being the place Jesus Christ was baptized and declared the Son of God. A Middle East crossroads bordered to the west by Israel and to the east by Jordan. This body of water has seen the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. It has surveyed a young David running for his life and for centuries. It had concealed the whereabouts of thousands of archaeological gems proving the continuity of scripture, the world-renowned Dead Sea Scrolls. However, recently there has been great controversies in the state of the river that makes the people of Jordan and Israel and even Palestine struggle. Is it the wrath of God, and what do we need to do to prepare if this is truly his message? Stay tuned, because today we will be discussing the terrifying discovery in Jordan River. I believe that God has plans, and this is one of them. We will go from stories related to the future of each country and see if they have anything to do with the Bible. The Jordan River is of symbolic and spiritual significance. Thousands making the annual pilgrimage to the river Jordan. On the road along the Jordan Valley, every car that passes stirs up a cloud of sand and dust. Greenhouses and fields lie alongside wastelands of cracked, parched earth. It is hard to believe that this stretch of land is the most fertile in all of Jordan. Jordan is one of the driest countries in the world, and desertification is progressing rapidly. Nine-tenths of agricultural land is being abandoned and turning into a desert landscape. Small farmers are struggling to survive. The most difficult thing is really the lack of water. I have a basin with 2,000 cubic meters, but in summer I would need twice that, says 26-year-old Soliman, who has taken over his father's land in Dair Allah, in the central part of the valley, the suffering Jordan Valley. Many farmers blame Israel for their problems. In 1964, Israel built dams upstream on the Jordan River, diverted it to its own agricultural land in the north, and then disposed of industrial and agricultural wastewater into the Jordan River. Syria responded with more dams on the Yarmouk River, which flows into the Jordan River in the north. As a result, the Holy River has lost up to 98% of its historical volume and is contaminated with heavy metals, the APN has criticized in several publications. The holy river of the three monotheistic religions has shrunk to a muddy, polluted stream since the 1960s, and its water has become unusable for agriculture. Now instead of the river, a canal irrigates the valley with recycled water from other sources, but only in dribs and drabs. Jordanian agriculture lives to the rhythm of Israel's occupation of Palestine. Despite the dusty air in the valley, the occupied West Bank is visible on the other side of the Jordan River. Jordanian agriculture is very sensitive to crises in the region, as the country quickly became dependent on international aid due to its alliance with the US and Israel. An agreement that provided for the exchange of Israeli water for Jordanian solar power was finally canceled by the Jordanian government under pressure from huge pro-Palestinian demonstrations in November. The reason. Israel's war on Gaza which has claimed over 31 Thuanis, Palestinian lives. The majority of Jordanians, being of Palestinian descent, are extremely critical of their menacing neighbor. My mother is originally from Nablus. I could never accept water from Israel, says Soliman. Catastrophic work conditions. In the fields along the highway in the Jordan Valley, thousands of kefia-covered men and women struggle against the dust, their backs bent under the harsh sun. For the 210,000 agricultural workers in the kingdom, including many Syrian refugees and Egyptian migrants, working conditions are catastrophic. No one can help the farmers and workers better than themselves, especially when they join forces with students, doctors and other workers to demand their rights. In the fields of the Jordan Valley, these successes plant hope that, one day, Jordanians might reclaim their food sovereignty and dignity. When the Israeli government cut off supplies of water to the Gaza Strip following Hamas's brutal attack, it put the role of water within human conflict into particularly sharp relief. Debate on the notion of water wars has raged among water experts for nearly four decades. In 1988, Boutros Boutros Ghali, who later became Secretary General of the United Nations, said that the next set of wars will be over water. However, the years since have seen no clear instances of wars fought over water making such a bold statement seems somewhat misguided in hindsight. So, can the converse be true? Can the sharing of water across borders be a mechanism for creating lasting peace, even if what water is available is scarce? 
managing water scarcity. The Jordan River Basin is, by any reasonable metric, one of the most parched areas of the world. All countries in the region have water availability per person that's well below the global threshold to be labeled as water scarce. As with all watersheds, the river we see on the surface is only one part of a wider basin that, in the case of the Jordan River, is about the size of Turkey, almost 19,000 square kilometers. This basin drains into the Dead Sea and its water resources are shared by Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, Palestine and Syria. Each has had its own approach for dealing with this water scarcity. This has had profound consequences for their social and economic development and for environmental protection. Jordan and Syria have struggled with water management, which is partly reflected in lower economic productivity, U4100 dollars and U1100 dollars GDP per capita respectively. In contrast, Israel has utilized high-technology solutions to manage its water and innovated considerably in agricultural applications, becoming the world leader in drip irrigation. Such technological achievements are reflected in its comparatively high $42,000 GDP per capita, a history of cooperation and conflict. With water scarcity comes intense competition for limited water resources. Typically, such competition not only exists across international borders, but among different sectors within a country. In countless situations of internationally shared waters, countries have sat across the table with each other and found ways to manage water challenges. The classic example of such collaboration is the Indus Water Treaty between bitter rivals India and Pakistan, which has lasted since 1960 through wars and tense diplomatic relations between the two countries. In the Jordan River Basin, a poignant example is the picnic table conversations between Jordan and Israel, a joint water management process that started in 1953 and continued even when the two countries were officially at war from 1948 until the Israel-Jordan Peace Treaty in 1994. A formal water-sharing agreement between Israel and Jordan on the Yarmouk River, a tributary of the Jordan River, can be found in Annex II of the 1994 treaty. While the agreement is far from perfect and has been criticized for not giving due consideration to Palestinian usage downstream, it has endured. The agreement does not mention the Golan Heights, and yet it allows Israel to use water emanating from it. Another 1984 agreement between Jordan and Syria on the Yarmouk River is also in place and was developed to allow construction of the El Wadat Unity Dam. Does today's story of compromise between two Middle Eastern countries that we just passed remind you of any details in the revelation? Surely you will have the same thought as me. That is the two cities which were mentioned in the Genesis. As we read the visions in Genesis, we will find two cities mentioned by name, Sodom and Gomorrah. This article will look at these two cities, the central place they have in Genesis, and the relevance they had for those first century churches, as well as us today. Genesis features two symbolic cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. Unlike the symbolic cities in Revelation, these were believed to be real cities located in the Jordan Valley region. However, their exact location remains unknown. The Bible portrays them in a negative light, destroyed by God for their wickedness. The primary reason for their destruction was their widespread sinfulness. The Bible doesn't explicitly detail the nature of the sins but it's implied to involve inhospitable treatment of strangers, Genesis 19.9, and sexual immorality, Genesis 19.4-5. God decided to destroy the cities due to the severity of their sin. Two angels were sent to warn Lot, a righteous man living in Sodom, and to evacuate him and his family before the destruction, Genesis 19.12-13. Burning sulfur and fire rained down from heaven, destroying Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis 19.24. Sodom will fall and Gomorrah will be exalted. In Genesis, humanity is presented with two nascent societies taking root. One path leads towards Eden, a paradise built on obedience to God's will. This city, though threatened by the expulsion, holds the promise of restored fellowship with the divine. The other path leads towards Babel, a towering city constructed on human ambition and prideful self-sufficiency. Though Babel appears strong and united, its foundation is shaky. God's intervention scatters its people, demonstrating the folly of human arrogance in the face of his power. 
the choice is clear. Commune with God in humble dependence, or be consumed by the destructive fires of human pride. God has a reason for everything he does. Each and every action he takes has purpose, is right and good. Through a limited, wordly, human perspective that can seem difficult to accept. Certain incidents in the Bible seem to contradict this truth, though that is usually because they are taken out of context, and a little prayer and study often illuminates the Lord's purposes. In Genesis, during the days of Abraham, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were powerful cities that The diminishing flow of the Euphrates, therefore, is not merely seen through the lens of climate change or water management, but is imbued with a deeper, apocalyptic resonance for believers. This perspective views the drying of the Euphrates as a sign, a harbinger of significant events prophesied in sacred texts. These interpretations speak to the profound connection between humanity and the natural world, where environmental changes are seen as reflective of broader cosmic narratives. It's a viewpoint that underscores the diverse ways in which the Euphrates is integral to the identity and beliefs of the region's inhabitants. While the scientific community focuses on the tangible aspects of the river's decline, climate change, dam construction, and water mismanagement, the religious interpretation adds a layer of complexity to the discourse. It invites a reflection on the myriad ways humans relate to their environment, not just as a resource to be managed or a challenge to be overcome, but as an integral part of a larger spiritual story. The drying of the Euphrates encapsulates a confluence of narratives, ecological, historical, and prophetic. For some, it serves as a poignant reminder of the intertwined fate of nature and human belief, urging a contemplation of our place within a world where environmental shifts carry both material and metaphysical implications. As we navigate the practical challenges posed by the river's decline, we're also invited to consider the deeper, spiritual dimensions that resonate with many who watch these changes unfold. It said to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. This verse is part of the apocalyptic visions in Revelation, where the Euphrates River is mentioned in the context of end time events. Revelation 9.14, NIV. Historical and Geographical Significance. The Euphrates, a river that has been a cradle of civilization and a lifeline for the Middle East for thousands of years. Stretching over 2,800 kilometers through Turkey, Syria, and Iraq, the Euphrates have played a pivotal role in the development of human societies, nurturing the lands that bore the ancient civilization of Mesopotamia, often referred to as the cradle of civilization. The Euphrates River is not merely a body of water. It's a historical archive, telling stories of human progress, conflict, and cultural evolution. Its banks have witnessed the rise and fall of empires and the birth of writing, law, and agriculture. This river has been a source of life, providing essential irrigation to the fertile lands that have supported human settlements for millennia. It has been a channel for transportation and trade, linking communities and cultures, and facilitating exchanges that have shaped the course of history. The cultural value of the Euphrates is immeasurable. It has been immortalized in literature, religion, and mythology, reflecting its central role in the identity and heritage of the region. The river has been a witness to the ebb and flow of human endeavor, from the ancient Sumerians who built their remarkable cities along its banks, to the modern nations that still rely on its waters for sustenance. However, the Euphrates is more than a relic of the past. It remains a vital artery for the region, supporting millions of people who depend on it for agriculture, fishing, and drinking water. As we consider the challenges facing the Euphrates today, from water scarcity to environmental degradation, it's crucial to remember the river's historical and cultural significance. Protecting and preserving the Euphrates is not just about securing a resource. It's about honoring a legacy that has shaped human history. The Euphrates River stands as a testament to the resilience and ingenuity of human civilizations. As we navigate the complexities of the modern world, let us draw inspiration from the enduring legacy of the Euphrates, a river that has given so much to humanity and holds the keys to understanding our shared past. Biblical and Islamic References This ancient river, winding through the heart of the Middle East, holds a special place not only in the geography of the region, but also within the sacred texts of two of the world's major religions, 
Christianity, and Islam. Tonight, we delve into the prophetic dimensions of the Euphrates, as foretold in the Bible and Islamic eschatology, and the profound implications these narratives hold in the contemporary context. The Euphrates is more than a river. It is a symbol steeped in religious significance, mentioned with reverence in both the Bible and Islamic texts. Biblical prophecies, particularly in the books of Jeremiah and Revelation, speak of a time when the Euphrates will dry up, preparing the way for momentous events. In the book of Revelation, the drying of the Euphrates is depicted as a precursor to the gathering of kings from the east for the final battle, an imagery rich with apocalyptic undertones. Similarly, Islamic eschatology holds its predictions concerning the Euphrates. One of the most intriguing prophecies speaks of the river revealing a mountain of gold, leading to widespread strife and conflict among those who seek to claim it. This narrative, while symbolic, emphasizes the river's significance in the unfolding of future events, intertwining the fate of the Euphrates with pivotal moments in human history. As we witness the environmental challenges facing the Euphrates today, from diminishing water levels to ecological degradation, these ancient prophecies take on new resonance. The physical changes occurring in the river's flow stir reflections on the deeper spiritual meanings embedded within these sacred texts. For believers, the current state of the Euphrates might be seen as a fulfillment of prophecy, a sign of the times that calls for introspection and, perhaps, a renewed commitment to stewardship of the earth. The Euphrates River embodies a fascinating confluence of religious prophecy and environmental reality. Its mention in both the Bible and Islamic texts as a site of future prophetic events adds layers of meaning to the challenges it faces in the modern world. As we contemplate the future of this storied river, we are reminded of the enduring interplay between faith, history, and the natural world, and the profound ways in which our spiritual narratives are woven into the fabric of the Earth's unfolding story. Environmental and Political Challenges The river's woes are multifaceted, starting with the harsh reality of drought. Climate change has intensified weather patterns across the region, leading to prolonged dry spells that reduce the river's flow and diminish its capacity to sustain agriculture, wildlife, and human settlements along its banks. The impact on agriculture is particularly severe. The Euphrates is a crucial source of irrigation for vast areas, and its dwindling waters mean less arable land, lower crop yields, and heightened food insecurity. Overuse of the river's resources compounds the problem. Unsustainable water management practices including the over-extraction of water for agriculture, domestic, and industrial use, strain the river's natural balance. This overuse not only depletes the river but also disrupts local ecosystems, leading to loss of biodiversity and degradation of habitats essential for various species' survival. Geopolitical tensions over water management add another layer of complexity. The Euphrates flows through several countries, each with its interests and demands on the river's resources. Disputes over water rights and usage have led to strained relations and hindered cooperative efforts to address the river's challenges. The lack of a comprehensive, multilateral approach to water management exacerbates the situation, leaving critical issues unresolved and the river's future uncertain. The Euphrates River's plight is a stark reminder of the intricate link between environmental sustainability and geopolitical harmony. As the river's flow decreases, so too does the prosperity of the communities that have relied on it for generations. The challenges facing the Euphrates are a call to action for regional cooperation and sustainable management practices. Only through collective efforts can we hope to restore the health of this vital waterway and secure the livelihoods of those who depend on it. The fate of the Euphrates is not just a regional concern, but a global one, highlighting the need for urgent action in the face of environmental and political adversity. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Similar to Revelation 9.14, this verse also refers to the Euphrates in an end-time prophecy. Specifically, it's drying up to facilitate the gathering of armies for the Battle of Armageddon. As we conclude our exploration of the Euphrates River's plight, it's clear that what we're witnessing is not just the drying of a river, but a profound signal of the times we live in. The Euphrates, with its storied past and critical role in the present, stands as a stark reminder of the delicate interplay between environmental health, historical heritage, and human survival. 
Tonight, we reflect on the broader implications of the river's decline and the urgent call to action it embodies. The challenges facing the Euphrates, drought, overuse, and geopolitical tensions highlight a complex nexus of issues at the heart of environmental conservation and sustainable development. These issues are not isolated. They are symptomatic of a global environmental crisis that requires concerted efforts, innovative solutions, and a commitment to change at both individual and collective levels. The drying of the Euphrates is a wake-up call, urging us to recognize the interconnectedness of our actions and the environment. It compels us to consider how the stewardship of our natural resources, the legacy of our historical heritage, and the viability of future generations are inextricably linked. The river's decline is not just a regional concern, but a global one, reflecting broader environmental challenges that transcend borders and demand a unified response. As we move forward, awareness must translate into action. Sustainable water management, cross-border. As we conclude our journey along the Euphrates, we're left with a stark reminder of its critical state and the profound implications for our future. This ancient river, a lifeline of civilizations, now mirrors the urgent challenges we face in preserving our planet's environmental health, our rich historical heritage, and ultimately, our survival. The drying of the Euphrates calls us to action, urging us to recognize the interconnectedness of our actions and the natural world. Let this be a wake-up call, a catalyst for awareness and change, as we strive to safeguard the legacy of the Euphrates for generations to come. For generations to come. For generations to come. For generations to come.